Good morning. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, let's take you through the headlines. Asian markets are off to a weak start as global trade tensions resurface. The IPO of Ujiban Small Finance Bank gets a healthy response. The issue is fully subscribed on the first day of bidding. Oil prices rise the most in a week as prospects of a deeper production cut from OPEC and its allies arise. And Aditya Ghosh has been elevated to the board of hospi hospitality chain Oyo. He has stepped down as the CEO of the India and South Asian business. Let's talk about US markets now. They resumed after the truncated holiday week on a weak note. Benchmark indices posted their second straight day of losses. It was also their biggest one-day fall in eight weeks on the back of weak manufacturing data and trade concerns. Abigail Doolittle wraps up Monday's trading action on Wall Street in this report. Stocks fell sharply in Monday's Wall Street session with the Dow, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq all falling by about nine tenths of one percent to a little more than one percent. The SOX or the chip index down even more, down about one and a half percent. Now, this came on a combination of issues, including uh, tariffs reimposed tariffs, steel tariffs on Brazil and Argentina uh, by the U.S. President Trump saying those companies are devaluing their currencies and that's hurting U.S. farmers. That set a bit of a bearish tone. Then the ISM manufacturing number for the month of November came in worse than expected, the fourth month of contraction in a row. And then a report surfaced uh, that the U.S. may increase tariffs on China soon if a trade deal is not reached uh, in the relatively near future. Put it all together and we did have those declines uh, for the major averages. Interestingly though, Haven bonds also sold off. So we did not have the classic relationship of stocks going lower and Haven bonds going higher. Instead, stocks and bonds lower together. That could reflect, though, the fact that into uh, the current week, bonds had been basically rallying uh, for two weeks here in the U.S. As for some outsized movers, Roku, uh, the hardware for streaming TV, those shares down 15 percent as Morgan Stanley cut the stock to the equivalent of a sell on valuation concerns. Valuation indeed, given the stock is up into Monday's Wall Street session by about 400 percent. Deer was also down sharply, not as sharply, down uh, a little more than one and a half percent. Cut at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, uh, also to the equivalent of a sell. The analysts there concerned by uh, agriculture that there could be some weakness in 2020. This, of course, after Deer cut its 2020 outlook last week. And then finally, oil and natural gas popping a bit higher. Oil up more than 1% or around 1% uh, after or on speculation that OPEC may, in fact, uh, make bigger output cuts than expected. While natural gas popping higher, perhaps after the worst November since 2001. But there's also snow here in New York. That could be a factor, too. From New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. All right, and uh, turning to the Asia-Pacific region, it seems it's going to be cuts across the board. Uh, more markets coming on stream as we speak. I'm joined uh, live by Rosalind Chin from uh, the Bloomberg Studios in Hong Kong. Uh, Rosalind, uh, yesterday you had the manufacturing PMI data coming out from China, so that was better than expected. But now with this trade tension re-emerging, it seems like it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride today. You're exactly right. Uh, this trade tension re-emerging globally, not just with the U.S. and China now, and also, of course, uh, disappointing ISM data coming out of the U.S. as well, which uh, didn't help matters either. So right now we've got uh, most of the major boards in the Asia region trading lower. The MSCI Asia Pacific down by 0.8 percent. Uh, Nikkei and Topics leading the way in terms of uh, the the, the um, indices here. Uh, the uh, Nikkei is down more than 1 percent, and the Nikkei, uh, the Topics is down 0.9 percent right now. So we did have no president. President Trump are proposing these tariffs also on $2.4 billion of French goods. And that was in response to a digital tax, uh, which uh, he says will hurt U.S. tech firms. That in retaliation as well, of course, to these levies that he wants to reinstate on um, steel and manufacturing from Brazil and Argentina. On top of that, of course, this looming December 15th deadline, which is coming up, uh, in which uh, the U.S. may uh, raise those levies on Chinese imports as well. So this global trade picture really does not seem to be getting better. It seems to be like one step forward and two steps back, or maybe even one step forward and two steps back at this point in time. So investors really still very jittery on that kind of news. So we've got the Chinese markets opening up just a few moments ago. The uh, Shanghai Composite down uh, by about half of 1% right now. The Hang Seng lower by 1.3% right now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was also... Um, 
the Japanese markets. One of the stocks there though, that uh, is flipping the trend a little bit is Nintendo. This is an interesting one because uh, essentially Nintendo is jumping right now. The stock is up 1.27%, up for a second day uh, after a, a close, a re its highest close since 2018. Uh, you have to mark December the 4th, which is Wednesday in your calendar because that is when Tencent says they will have some news to share uh, about uh, the Switch consoles. So uh, Nintendo jumping on that news uh, and the announcement that there will be news even. So you can see uh, it's some uh, Nintendo consumers are looking for some good news out of that. Also, uh, last market we want to look at is Australia. That S&P ASX 200 pulling lower by more than 2% right now. Uh, we are expecting the RBA um, to make a rate decision later on today. It's expected to hold its cash target rate at 0.75%. We are seeing signs of revival in the housing market there. And in fact, house prices did rise uh, very quickly in, um, in November. In fact, the fastest pace in 16 years. So that is another uh, bolster for the RBA to uh, be holding rates there. So we're looking out for that announcement later on today. So all in all, really a bit of a down day on the Asian markets. Trade, of course, the biggest factor, uh, which is, seems to be influencing investors right now. Back to you. All right. Thanks so much for that, uh, Rosalind. And indeed, we want to speak a little bit more about uh, the trade tensions that have just emerged. A tweet from U.S. President Donald Trump reignited global trade tensions. Trump reimposed tariffs on steel from Argentina and Brazil. This has sparked concerns on whether the U.S. will also impose more tariffs on China if a deal is not reached. Remember, the deadline is the 15th of December. Sarah McGregor and Stephen Engel of Bloomberg News get, get you the latest on that front. The Trump administration just sort of proves to us time and again that tariffs are their preferred trade tool to try and back countries into a corner and get what they want from them. You know, we saw the Argentinian and Brazilian tariffs today. Of course, uh, Secretary Wilbur Ross reminding us that those December 15th tariffs are coming up in the China deal. And then we just had an announcement on the French digital tax that the Trump administration is proposing uh, tariffs on $2.4 billion worth of French goods in, in retaliation for that French digital tax. So really a reminder that that hawkish trade policy of the Trump administration that puts tariffs first is still very much in play. And this really plays into the China trade relationship as well, right? Given that Brazil and Argentina, Sarah, are big suppliers to China that seem to have replaced the U.S. Absolutely. This is, um, you know, it, it, sort of an acknowledgement, I think, that, that China has looked for some of its purchases for things like soybeans from Argentina, from Brazil. And of course, that's been the detriment to the detriment of American farmers. They are a big support base for President Trump. We know we're heading into elections less than a year now. The clock's ticking down and Trump really needs their support. And so I think that that any show to them that the Trump administration's in their corner, that it's trying to fight for them and take some real actions that may help them get those purchases back up, uh, you know, will help them. Of course, it's it's not a great moment then again for the for the Chinese talks because it looks like the Trump administration is really trying to find any route towards, um, you know, getting around China to be able to still be able to do trade. Steve, in the meantime, of course, the, the, the political angle is complicating the road to getting a trade deal done as well. Yeah. China's retaliation, which we had been bracing for over the past few days since the, uh, the signing was done by President Trump for the support of Hong Kong protesters, was it seen as being a pretty measured reaction? It is. I mean, because many people say, what are China's options other than on the trade front? But that's a you know slippery slope there. If you go uh, and retaliate on the economic and trade front for what is seen as a political impasse here in Hong Kong and a political uh, measure by the U.S. Congress and then subsequently signed last week by President Trump. So where does the Chinese, where do the Chinese retaliate? Well, so far, not trade related. Uh, they have put sanctions, according to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing late yesterday, on a number of non-governmental human rights groups based in the United States, who I might add do not have operations in mainland China already. So Amnesty International says it's a bit of an empty threat, unless, of course, they start restricting or putting sanctions on representatives or staff of these human rights groups here in Hong Kong or elsewhere. Now, among those human rights groups that are being sanctioned are National Endowment for Democracy, Human Rights Watch, and also Freedom House. But again, there is no uh, specifics on what kind of sanctions. Global Times, I might add, is 
is out with a, that's a state media tied to uh, the People's Daily, of course, a mouthpiece for the Communist Party. Global Times is reporting that uh, they may release, China may release soon, an unreliable entity list, which could include U.S. companies and also uh, some sort of blacklist uh, in, on individual sanctions on U.S. individuals. Uh, there's rumors that perhaps that could include U.S. lawmakers uh, preventing them from visiting China. All right, let's also take a look at what's making headlines across the globe. Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. We're going to start with China, which has responded to President Trump signing a bill supporting Hong Kong, but avoiding dragging trade into the spat. China's foreign ministry will suspend port visits by the U.S. Navy and sanction certain U.S. democracy groups. However, it's a low-key response, as China already barred American warships from Hong Kong back in August, and the democracy groups are already prevented from working on the mainland. More Chinese companies, meanwhile, have missed bond payments as the threat of widespread default grows. The latest failures are bonds worth a combined half a billion U.S. dollars and involve Peking University founder group and Tongsu Optu Electronics. The accelerating pace of missed payments highlights the rising strain triggered by the trade war and China's worst domestic slowdown in three decades. To China and Russia now, they have formally launched a major gas pipeline that further cements their long-planned energy partnership. Amid worsening relations with the U.S. and Europe, both Beijing and Moscow have been keen to improve business and energy links. The pipeline is more than 6,000 kilometers long and brings gas from Siberia to satisfy China's growing demand for cleaner power. And to economic uh, data in Hong Kong, retail sales suffered a record contraction in October. This is the city counts the cost of six months of political unrest. Retail sales by value contracted by 24.3% from a year earlier, the fourth month of double-digit declines. Now, by volume, sales fell more than 26%, which is also a record. Financial Secretary Paul Chan says he expects Hong Kong's first budget deficit since the early 2000s. And in the Philippines, thousands of people have moved to shelters on the largest island there as a powerful storm bears down on Manila. Typhoon Komori is expected to cross the coastline Tuesday morning, bringing sustained winds of 155 kilometers and gusts approaching 200. The storm has forced the cancellation of dozens of flights and may disrupt an athletics meeting involving competitors from across Southeast Asia. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and at TikTok, on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Sue Keenan. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's uh, also take a look at how the Indian markets are likely to open today. Agam Vakil is joining me to tell you all about the trade setup for the day and also what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, well, I, I think actually your guess is better than mine. But uh, <laughs> having said that, having said that, you know we're looking at weakness across the board uh, in Asia, and after <clears throat> the U.S. markets came on yeah. stream again, uh, is that likely to bear on Indian markets? Well, it certainly looks like the opening could be weaker, Alex, considering the SX Nifty is indicating that. And we must remember that yesterday the Nifty was really struggling to move above 12,100 and we saw a lot of writing on the high level calls as well. But I'll come to the options part in just a bit. Let's start by addressing what's happening with the SJX Nifty. And well, 23 points down for now, a likelihood of a weak start. Uh, in terms of how things panned out yesterday, what we saw for the Nifty was, well, flat, a uh, flat close, but there was a lot of weakness underneath. So the broader markets did see declines come through. The banking indices, again, uh, did see some amount of weakness, the public sector sp banks specifically in this case. But let's move on and talk about uh, your ADRs. At this point, we don't have too much to speak for. Uh, the moves on the ADRs were a lot more pronounced as compared to today. And uh, let's talk also talk about the, the contributors, or pardon me, the, the fund flows. So from yesterday's buying, it's turned into selling of sorts uh, from FIIs. And this time it's an outgo of around 1,700 crores on a net basis. DI is buying to the tune of around 754 crores. So 
Uh, well, it's, it's been a volatile time. We don't really have a trend as far as fund flows are concerned, specifically from institutions at this point in time. Coming down to contributors, it was Reliance Industries and Bharti Airtel. Of course, it was the telecom stocks which were, were, which were expected to lead the gains, but was cancelled out largely by some heavyweights like HDFC Bank, uh, TCS, and of course, Bajaj Finance was under a bit of pressure. But uh, moving on to, well, you know, futures and options. Uh, what we really saw was that while a lot of there was a lot of accumulation earlier on, on in the day that came down to further unwinding of positions. Do remember for a December series even we don't really have as much in terms of the open interest base for the future. So a lot of traders have been hesitant to take positions at this point in time. Moving on to your Nifty banking futures too, the picture isn't very different. We've seen unwinding, a decline of around 2%. In, in terms of options, uh, you know, the max OI remains with the 12,000 put and that's the only one which stands out for now. Of course, to a certain extent, the 12,500 call. But in terms of change in open interest, and this may give you a better idea about what's happening, is that we saw more writing around the 11,900 and 12,000 puts, which means that's a little bit of a resistance at this point in time, or pardon me, support, and resistance around the 12,100 uh, mark. Now, the Wix rose by as much as 2%, but it was not substantial. Sure, it went above 14, and the nifty put call ratio also on expected lines came off to a certain extent to around 1.44. In terms of stocks, uh, well, Biocon, of course, will be in focus. A lot of new slow coming through, and we did see advances there. Equitas holding an RBL bank, of course, will also be in focus on account of its fundraising. And in terms of other stocks that we are keeping an eye on is Dish TV, Bharti Airtel, and Canada Bank. See, unwinding. But besides that, uh, we're also watching out for uh, Bajaj Finance. But on the whole, we're not expecting too much from the in benchmark indices. Thanks so much for that, Agam. All right, Thomas Sarkar is joining me now to tell you uh, a little bit more about the stocks that you have to watch out for in trade today. Good morning, Somit. What's on your list today? Uh, good morning, Alex. I'll start off with Biocon. Now, Biocon and partner Mylan has launched the Trasher Zoom app, biosimilar in the U.S. market. Now, this is the second launch in the U.S. market uh, for Biocon after New Lista. Now, Morgan Stanley says that the addressable market for this product is around 2.2 billion U.S. dollars, and Bi Biocon and Mylan could generate nearly 180 to 220 million U.S. dollars in sales at a high margin in the first. Uh, in the first and the second years. Now for HSBC, they have upgraded Biocon's target price to 325 from 280 on the back of this launch. United Spirits will also remain focused because the board has approved the merger of companies listed arm that is Pioneer distillery, Distilleries with itself. Now United Spirits will issue nearly 10 equity shares of the company for every 47 equity shares of Pioneer Distilleries. Uh, RBL, RBL Bank will also remain in focus because they have opened their QIP. Now the board will meet on or after December 5th to consider the issue price and the flow price is set at 352.57 uh, rupees per share which is at, at a discount of nearly 5.6 percent to yesterday's closing price. CG Consumer Electricals because the private equity firm Advent International and Singapore State Investment Company that is Temasek are offering, nearly to, are offering to sell nearly 4.5 crore shares of the company at close to 40 rupees per share and the deal is valued at close to 1000, uh, 1100 crore rupees and investors also have an option to sell additional 1 crore shares. Tata Motors because they have won an order to supply nearly 2,300 buses to five st uh, state transport companies as the company said that it is working to complete the order by Feb 2020. IFCI because uh, the company says it has SF bids for sale of its entire stake in NSE and lastly ONGC and Oil India because uh, because this, uh, India's oil minister in the parliament has said that ONGC plans to invest nearly 1.6 lakh crore rupees while Oil India plans to invest nearly uh, 1,800 crore rupees in domestic exploration and production over the next five years. All right, thanks so much for that, Samit. Now, Aditya Ghosh has stepped down as the CEO for OYO's India and South Asia business and instead he will now be part of the company's board. Nishant Sharma spoke to both Ghosh and OYO founder Ritesh Agarwal and began by asking them about Ghosh's new role on the board. OYO is growing at a much faster pace than we had ever imagined. Mm -hmm. um, it's created a reach around the world which is much bigger than what it was about a year and a half back which is actually evidence of the fact that what we're really trying to do, which is basically build quality living spaces at an affordable price, there is a secular need for that around the world. 
And as the expectations from our consumers, from the external stakeholders, from our own employees become bigger, uh, you know, it's important for companies to evolve themselves and strengthen their capabilities globally. Hmm. Um, now, I come with certain kind of experiences, having come from a very highly regulated business, hmm. uh, run a large publicly traded business, which is also was very profitable. And in the last one year, I've had a really, like a, I guess, a dream run of running a very large region for OYO, which is the South Asia mm -hmm. region. And then Ritesh and I started talking, and you know, we felt, okay, you know, if we put the company first, what is that role that I should play, mm -hmm. and where, I, where can I kind of contribute, where we are able to build global capabilities? Which is where then the, you know, very kindly the board has invited me to come on to the, to mm -hmm. the, to the board of directors. I'm really excited about it. Um, and what I'm going to be probably doing mostly is work very closely with Ritesh and the other directors such as Betsy and Manish, Bijal, mm -hmm. Mohit, to see um, that what is it that is required to make OYO not just the largest and the fastest growing, but also one of the most loved and well-respected hospitality brands around the world. You know, if, if you had a dream like, you know, would this be seen as a blue chip company? Right. Uh, and in that then, you know, like most things at OYO, we create a, create a priority list for us, and we came up with five priorities saying, safety and security is going to be very key, you know, as a consumer core mm -hmm. preference. Um, what are the consumer needs that we're going to deliver on? Um, how do we manage the stakeholder communications around? How do we bring uh, even higher level of corporate governance, which is a journey that we've been on? And finally, even tactical things like revenue management, mm -hmm. Um, and so those are the five things that I'm going to be working on with, yeah. with Ritesh. Look, I think uh, to begin with, this is something that we've been discussing for a while. And the question that we constantly ask is what is the skill set that we bring uniquely that can help OYO become what it will become in the years to come? Right. As you know, increasingly the narrative around young companies is not just growth, but growing right and growing towards a path of profitability. And like Aditya said, he's one of the few colleagues in our management who comes with significant amount of experience there. So his availability on our board can enable mm -hmm. significant support for myself as well as our management in order to make sure that our company moves in a certain direction. Besides, of course, we've been in the path of making sure that we strengthen our board. Very recently, we made an appointment of Betsy Atkins, who's been on uh, multiple uh, uh, boards along with investing in eBay and Yahoo earlier. I think this is going to be a fantastic addition uh, with her in our uh, new board of directors. Right. And Aditya, would you be full time focusing as part of the board or are you also in some course of time looking for more opportunities, more things to you because you have been doing a lot of things? Yeah, um, I try to keep myself busy, <laughs> but I think this is going to take a, you know, right now I'm just focused on, on this, fr frankly, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot to do. Mm -hmm. um, and also I'm probably very keen on getting, getting my hands on this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, you know, but immediate priority also will be, uh, you know, ensuring a smooth transition between myself and my successor Rohit, who's also, you know, peer and colleague of mine at, at OYO, and then working with the board. So yeah, so I'm going to be focused on that for the moment. All right, let's uh, take you through some of the stories you'll find on the website, BloombergQuinn.com, if you go online right now. Uh, it goes without saying that all the stocks that we've covered so far, they go into stories called All You Need to Know and Stocks to Watch uh, on the website as well. But the first story, markets regulator SEBI's action against Kavi stockbroking has resulted in nearly 83,000 investors getting back their securities that were illegally transferred by the broker to its own account and were even pledged without any authorization. With the latest transfer by the National Securities Depository, that's the NSDL, nearly 90% of Kavi's investors have received their securities, while the rest will receive them after clearing their dues. In the aviation space, Indigo has told its pilots to stop pushing engines on its new Airbus uh, SE jets to the limit when the planes are climbing after India's aviation regulator said the practice may have contributed to turbines failing in the air. All the budget airlines A320neo aircraft now use a lower thrust setting following takeoff, according to a spokeswoman from Indigo which has suffered as many as 13 engine shutdowns during ascents this year. All right, that's all you need to know going into trade today, but do stay tuned. There's, of course, a lot to talk about over the next few hours. This is Bloomberg Quint.